curious how much you should charge for that handmade item, I'm going to lay out a formula for you to follow and we're going to go over that right now. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Tiffany Hansen with Hooked for Hope. Thank you so much for joining me today. In this video, we're going to go over the formula that you can use to help you determine how much to charge for your handmade item. If at any point in this video you do like what you see, please push that thumbs up button. And if you haven't yet, subscribe to my channel. That way you don't miss any of my videos. I am releasing a brand new video every single Friday covering a wide range of different types of crochet projects and you are not going to want to miss out. Having a formula to help you determine how much to appropriately sell your item for can actually be quite empowering. It really gives you a foundation to stand on. It helps give you something to lean on and support you when you are explaining to a customer, this is why I am pricing my item this much. It helps empower you in the sense of letting you know, okay, this is my foundation price that I'm not going to sell my item less than. And then you can play with all of the numbers up here that you can have sales, you can have discounts and still feel comfortable in knowing, okay, I'm still making more money than my base amount that I am not gonna go under. I've actually seen a couple different formulas used by a couple different people to determine how much to charge for an item. I've seen some people just want to charge for materials, cost of materials. I've also seen other people that will charge for every little teeny tiny itty bitty nitty gritty thing that could have associated to the making of this item. And the problem with having multiple different types of formulas is it gets really confusing for the customer. For example, say a customer goes to an event and on this table they see a beanie that is priced for this much. And then over here they see what looks to be the same beanie, but it costs a lot more. And they're like, hmm, okay. And then over on this table over here they see a third beanie that looks identical to these two beanies, but that beanie's price is in between these two beanies. And then the customer just gets confused like, I don't want to overpay for a beanie, uh, but I also want to make sure I get a good quality product. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the best quality beanie of the three options. And then I'm going to insist on the cheaper price because clearly they must be overcharging me for this product. Now it is really hard when a customer starts to think this way because maybe the person whose beanie was the best quality, maybe they did follow a good formula and maybe they can back up their price by, hey, my materials cost me this much, my time cost me this much, and this happened. So this is why the X, Y, and Z of my price, that's why my price is what my price is. But the customer, I mean, yes, having that formula helps the customer to understand the price, but then they're still kind of confused on, well, then why is their beanie so much cheaper than yours, I don't understand. So it would just be great if we could all get on the same page. This formula is actually not my own formula. I found this formula in a book made for people that want to sell their handmade items. It was specifically geared for artisans or crafters who wanted to be vendors. And I remember checking out this book from a library and reading all this information that really helped me to sell my items. And this formula has helped me in so many ways. It's given me confidence and like I said, empowered me and gave me reason and really helped me to identify how, how much to charge for my items. And I'm just hoping to forward on that knowledge and empower you as well with a formula that will really take out the guesswork and make it really simple to identify why your item should be priced as such. Okay, let's go ahead and dive right into that formula. The very first part we're going to talk about is the cost materials. The cost materials might be the most frustrating part of the whole process because it is so tedious. It's my least favorite part of the formula by far, but to be honest, it might be the most empowering part of the entire formula, making it one of the most important things. So even though it's tedious, even though it might take you a little while to do this part, once you have done the nitty gritty 
finding out the cost of all your materials, it will really empower you to know, okay, that is why the cost is the way it costs. And oh, now I know how to lower my costs. Now I know how to buy my materials to maximize the most I can buy for the least amount of money. Does that make sense? For example, okay, let me help you out. Let's take this beanie. The only thing involved in this beanie is the yarn to make the beanie. There are no buttons, there are no zippers, there are no decals, there's nothing other than the yarn to make the beanie. Okay, so now let's determine how many yards of yarn are in the beanie. So if I find out that it took me just over a full skein of yarn, so it took me one whole skein plus some, I'm like, okay, I need to know the exact amount of yards. Well, if it took a whole skein, then I know, okay, on the label, it gives me an approximate number of how many yards are in the skein. So there's approximately 170 yards in this skein or approximately 156 meters in this skein. So you can convert everything I'm saying into meters if, if the yards doesn't apply to where you are. Okay, so finding out, okay, so that's how many meters, so that's how many yards are in one skein, but I used just, just a little more than one skein. So what you can do is you can grab the second skein that you only used a little bit of, and you can measure out how many yards are left in that skein, and then subtract what was left from how much there should have been to begin with, and that will give you that little bit of yards, and that's how many extra yards were used to finish your beanie, okay? So in this case, I actually used 189 yards to make this beanie, just a little bit more than a full skein, okay? Knowing exactly how many yards went into this helps me so much because now I can identify, okay, if this yarn cost me, let's say, $2.50, for a whole skein and I need more than one to make a beanie, that means I'm spending $5 just for the yarn materials to make this beanie. But if I find a yarn that is comparable to this yarn and I get more yarn in this skein, I find out, oh, in this skein there's 355 yards. Now I know exactly how many yards are in this beanie so I can find out, well, how many beanies can I make? with this skein. See how it empowers you? You can buy a skein that's bigger, has more yarn. You can even use a coupon on this and now your cost of materials just went way down. I did the equation and I can make almost two beanies, just shy of two beanies with one skein of this yarn that I can use a coupon on and make it $3 opposed to this guy right here, which I need two of them. That means that I'm still going to be spending over, over $3 on materials. So then you can really educate yourself on how to buy your materials smarter. Does that make sense? Now let's go ahead and dive into something different. Okay. What if you're making a stuffed animal? Okay. So now you need to come up with the cost of your buttons. How much was one individual button? If your buttons came in like a pack and the pack was a dollar, then you would take the dollar and divide it by how many buttons were in the pack. And now you have the cost per button that you're going to add in your cost of materials section. The polyfill stuffing, that can be tricky because all you get is a giant sack of polyfill. You get this giant sack of polyfill. And it's really hard to divvy up how much each section is worth in the scheme of how much the pack was because it's all going to differ. It's going to be an approximation. It's really hard to divide this up evenly and get an accurate number of uh, price on your polyfill. So that's going to be an approximation. You can get a definite number on the buttons. You can get a definite number on how many yards of the blue yarn you used. How many yards of the brown yarn did you use? And be able to find out how much then did it cost from the amount of the skein. For example, if the blue yarn, I only used 25 yards of blue yarn. So then I'd find out, okay, in the skein, there was 325 yards in the skein. I spent $3 on that skein of yarn. Then I would take the, the $3 divided by how many yards are in that skein. And then I would times that by the 25 yards that it took me 
to make this little guy. And that will give me how much the blue yarn cost me. And then do the same for the brown yarn. And then find out how much the brown yarn cost you. And that will be your cost of materials. Like I said, it's a tedious process, but once you've done it, it's so empowering because now that you know how much yarn it took you to make the blue, you can now find out how many blue monkeys, in this example, can you make with a whole skein of yarn? And then you can find out, okay, well, how low can I bring that cost of that skein of yarn down? And you can just focus on really bringing down the cost of your materials and finding out how much you can make with, with your materials. It's really, really cool. So that is your cost of materials. Now let's go to your cost of your time. The cost of your time, I recommend that you begin by giving yourself minimum wage per hour. You, if you're not sure what minimum wage is for you, you can easily Google this by Googling what is the minimum wage for the state of where, whichever state you live in. If you don't live in the United States, you can also Google what country you live in. So what is the minimum wage for Canada? What is the minimum wage for Mexico? What is the minimum wage for the UK? What is the minimum wage for Greece? What is the minimum wage for just whatever country you live in? And if you're still struggling, if you live in a part of the world where you're still struggling to find out what your minimum wage is, just go with the minimum wage of the next country next to you. Okay, that's going to be the closest association that you'll probably get, which will probably make sense. So start with your minimum wage. I say start with your minimum wage because that is a very fair amount for you. Uh, you don't want to go less than that because that's that's not fair to you to, to be working, making these things and not even making minimum wage. Okay, so please just start with minimum wage then take how much time it took you to make something. So if it took you an hour and a half to make an item, and let's just say that your minimum wage is $8 an hour, so then the cost of your time to make that item would be $12. Does that make sense? That is the cost of your time. Now, I want you to be cautious about giving yourself more than that per hour. There are going to be some people that don't want to make minimum wage per hour. It's a pride thing. They want to make more than that because they deserve more than that. You can make up your money in another location that I will explain to you. But for now, start with minimum wage for your item and you can make up that extra money in this other location. Okay, if you do find or feel that your quality is a very high quality item and that you feel that your work is deserving more than minimum wage status, you can increase yours by a dollar or two, but you want to keep the cost of your time low and that will make a lot of sense when I get to that wholesale number and why you want to keep that number low. Your cost of your time. You want, you don't want to give yourself anything less than minimum wage. You deserve it. You are worthy of at least getting minimum wage per hour. Okay. And then multiplying minimum wage by how much time it took you to make that item. You don't have to get super specific. So if you, it took you 38 minutes to make this thing. You can do the math to get the exact amount of how much that would be, but really just go off of every 15 minutes, okay? So 15, 30, 45, an hour. So every quarter, it will really help you to just make the math a lot more easy to work with. When you are recording yourself or finding out how much time it takes you to make an item, get a stopwatch. Or on your phone, you might already have a stopwatch. So if you go to the clock, there is a stopwatch section right there. What you do is you will push start, set to your phone down, and you'll start working. You'll start working, however, whatever you're working on, handmade item. So work, work, work. If you need to set your project down, set it down, then come to your stopwatch and hit stop, set your phone down, leave and go do whatever you have to do, okay? When you come back, then you push start again, put your phone down and you'll come back to the project and work, work, work. What I'm getting at is you only wanna record the time it took you to actually make the item. You can't include the breaks. If it took you a whole day to complete this beanie, 
because you had to keep setting the project down and go handle a distraction and then come back, pick it up and work on it, then set it down, go deal with another distraction, come back, pick this up and keep working on it. If it took you a whole day to finish this beanie, you can't charge for a whole day's work is what I'm getting at. You can only charge for the hour and a half that it actually took you to make the beanie. If after you come back and you look at your clock, after all the times you pushed start, pushed pause, pushed start, pushed pause, at the end of making your beanie, if it said that it took you an hour and a half to make it, that's how much time it actually took you to physically work on this item, okay? That's the only thing you can charge for. You cannot charge somebody for the fact that you took an hour lunch. You cannot charge somebody for the fact that your kids made a huge mess and now you have to go clean that up. Okay, you can only charge somebody for how much time it took you to physically work on that item. Okay, so that's where the stopwatch really comes in handy. Because there's actually been a couple times where I thought it took me like two hours to make something. And when I actually timed myself, it only took me an hour and a half. And I'm like, oh, okay. It didn't take me quite as long as I thought. Or vice versa, where I thought, oh, I thought it only took me an hour and a half hour and a half to make something and it actually took me two and a half hours to make it and I'm like oh good to know that's good to know does that make sense so it's important to actually be accurate with how much time it did take you to make the item and a stopwatch is very helpful in identifying accurate time increments okay now that we've gone over the formula let's actually plug in some numbers and work through the formula together for example let's take the beanie Okay, so we determined that it took us an hour and a half to make the beanie. If, we're, if our minimum wage number is $8 an hour, that means the cost of our time to make this beanie was $12. Following the amount of materials, the cost of materials to make this beanie was $1.51. So then we add $1.51 plus 12 equals, and that's $13.51. But we don't stop there. We don't stop at the 13 1351. We now need to add 10% to that number. But why? Why do we add 10%? Well, that 10% actually accounts for all the unaccounted for. For example, what about that price tag that you wanted to add to the item? What about your time for packaging that item up? You didn't account for those things, you know, putting or creating the tag or, cre or packaging something up. That wasn't part of the process. Uh, replacing that crochet hook, replacing those knitting needles, replacing your scissors, replacing your rope markers, replacing your tape measure, all of your tools that are not something that you need to replace on an item by item basis, right? So the 10% is to cover the unaccounted for just to make sure that you're not cutting yourself short. Does that make sense? It also accounts for, for example, if I were to use my fabric glue, I only use just like the smallest little dab of the fabric glue. That is really difficult to actually account for, break down for math. So I will actually make up for that in the 10% of the unaccounted for that will cover that material that I couldn't quite break down enough. Does that make sense? Okay, so we got the 10%. And the 10% is really small. 10% of 1351 is just $1.35. Okay, so when you add 1351 to $1.35, you get 1486. So that is your wholesale number. Okay, 1486 is our baseline number. Do not sell this item or in particular, the beanie that we just did the math for, I would not sell this beanie for less than the 1486. That is my foundation price. I'm not gonna go below that because that's not fair to me. And that price makes sense to the customer. Okay, I understand why it is that price. So this is going to be your wholesale number that you give to anyone that wants to buy your items. That way they can sell them in their store or in their little boutique or in their shop. This is the number you're going to hopefully give to your friends and family. If you want to give, if you want to sell your item to your friends and family for anything less than wholesale, you might as well just gift it to them to make it fair for you in your time. Wholesale number is just your firm number. 
And that's where you get a lot of that empowerment. That's where you get a lot of that stability, that foundation, that backup that you need so much, okay? So once you have the wholesale number, now we move to the retail price. When you think of big box stores, the big stores, they will take an item at wholesale price and they will either double or triple that price and that is the number they present to the customer. When it comes to handmade things, what I've run into is I can't always double or triple a price. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. For example, the beanie that we've been using for our example, it's right under $15. It's $14.86. So I'm just going to round up to $15 to make it easy math. That is my wholesale number. For retail, to double that price would make this beanie $30. Yes, I could absolutely sell this beanie for $30. Put a really cute little tag on it to identify that it is my creation and really make it special. Okay, somebody would absolutely buy this for $30 and now I have just profited that $15. Now it kind of makes more sense why you don't need to increase how much you make per hour on your item because your cost of your time, sure, you can mess with it if you're a professional, if you've been doing this for a long time and your work is exceptional. Give yourself more for your time, absolutely but you don't need to give yourself $20 an hour <laughs> because that messes with your wholesale number and you make that up with your retail number. So we just made $15 off of this with our retail number, okay? Or some people will triple their number, $45. Okay, $45 might be a bit much for this beanie, but if you put a really cool decal on it, if you put like a leather or metal or wood thing on here to just make it extra special, Somebody could buy that, and by spending $45 on this beanie, it will now make them feel really special. It will say more about the quality of this beanie. It will definitely speak volumes about the product and making it look more valuable. That's why I don't want you to go under your wholesale number, because if you try to cheap out on your item and say, no, I wanna sell this beanie at $8 because I need, to, I need to move product, I want to sell, 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 well, that just devalued this entire beanie. Now somebody's gonna look at this beanie and they're gonna wonder, why are you selling it so cheap? What's wrong with it? And why, why should I value it at $8? I don't understand. Whereas when you up the price, you give it more value. It's a handmade item. It has quality. It has so much more to offer somebody than just something that you don't even know where it came from. Don't devalue your item. You might not be able to triple your item. You might not even be able to double your item. For example, a lot of my stuffed animals, I can't bring myself to double that price personally. Um, my wholesale number on a stuffed animal, for example, one in particular is $12. I cannot, for some reason, sell that item for more than $18. So that seems to be my sweet spot. Well, $18 is only 1.5 times more than my wholesale number. It is what it is. That is the number that people seems to seem to be most comfortable spending their money on. That's what I'm getting at. You've got to feel out your customer base. Sometimes you can double Sometimes you can't. That's where it can be really tricky with your numbers. Having the wholesale number is really easy. You just do your cost of materials plus your cost of your time equals a number and you add 10% to that number and that's your wholesale number. Easy math right there, okay? The retail number is a number that you can play with and you just got to feel it out until you reach that sweet number that customers seem to really identify with and you're still making money. So it makes sense in both situations for the customer and for you. And sometimes this takes time. Yeah, I'm not always able to double my cost. So you just got to feel out the market. If you have stuff on your table and people will come up and they'll be like, ooh, that looks cute or ooh, I like that. And they pick it up and they look at the price tag and they're like, ooh, okay, thank you. And they walk on. Um, just take a mental note of that because if only one person does it, I wouldn't think anything of it. Somebody else might come up right behind them and say, ooh, I like that, and just buy it straight off. But if you notice consistently, I'm not selling anything. There's a lot of people coming to my table looking at my stuff, but I'm not selling anything. You might want to reevaluate your prices, okay? Uh, it's really going to be hard when you're getting started and you're feeling it out. And also, if you're getting started and you're a relatively newer crocheter and you're still working on your tension and you're still working on the quality of your products, 
um, where one person can sell something a, a higher price, a really expensive price, you might not be quite there yet. Your item hasn't reached this person's level, so you can't charge what this person's charging because your quality isn't there yet, okay? And you just gotta be realistic with yourself, get the vibe of, off the customers, and just keep practicing and working at that. But there's other examples that I could use as well, such as I used to make head wraps with these cute little flowers, and I sold them in coffee shops, and I started them off at uh, wholesale times 1.5 because that just seemed to be a consistent number for me. So I was selling these head wraps for $20, and they were selling really well. So I decided to increase the number and increase the number and increase the number, and I got to the point where I was actually able to double my wholesale price, but it took me a second to feel out the customer base. And by the time I did get to the point where I was double my wholesale price, my sales did start to level off. They didn't get so crazy as they were before, but I was still selling. And the perspective of the beanies, people just thought more highly of the quality, thought more highly of the product than having them more expensive than they did when they were $20 head wraps. It's amazing how people view a more expensive item with a more pristine eye than they do a cheaper item where they have, uh, they think less of it. So keep that in mind too when you're pricing your item. That's where it's tricky. It's really easy to give you the formula for the wholesale price. The retail price is a little more tricky because again, it's going to differ depending on where you live, the quality of your item, quality of your materials, <laughs> and where you're selling. Are you selling in a cute little upscale boutique or are you selling at a farmer's market? You're gonna get a different clientele. Feel things out, be flexible, be prepared to um, adjust your prices and feel them out until they start to make sense and you start seeing a flow, okay? Of course, if you have any questions at all, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below, a question in the comments. You can always contact me with by emailing me at hookedforhope at gmail.com. You can find me at any of my socials, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I can be found at Hooked for Hope and you can ask your questions there. I really hope this was helpful. If you did like this, you might also like my other videos on how to sell your crocheted items. Check this video out, which is just a recommended video for you to watch. Thank you so much for watching. Like this video, subscribe to my channel, and I will see you with my next video. Bye guys.